Welcome back to Student to Stud. In this episode, we'll go over femoral neck fractures and everything that you should know as a medical student. Here's the basic outline that we'll cover in this presentation. Time for the first case of the day. What do you see? We have three views, AP pelvis, AP left hip, and cross table lateral of a left hip, demonstrating a non-displaced and incomplete left femoral neck fracture. How would you treat this type of fracture? We'll shortly go over the different treatment options for femoral neck fractures, but in this case, it would be amenable to three cannulated screws in an inverted triangle configuration. We will now go over the typical presentation for a patient who sustains a femoral neck fracture. Typically, Patients that are older will sustain a low energy type injury such as falling from ground level and sustain a femoral neck fracture. These patients will more likely have osteoporosis. The next cohort of patients are going to be in your younger type population who sustain a higher energy injury such as a motor vehicle accident. These types of femoral neck fractures will more likely be vertically oriented. It is important to note that femoral neck fractures can have an associated femoral shaft fracture, so it is important to image the entire femur. Femoral shaft fractures in conjunction with femoral neck fractures can be seen 6 to 9% of the time. It is important to treat the femoral neck before treating the femoral shaft. On physical exam, these patients will have pain with log roll and attempted straight leg raise. Patients that have a non-displaced femoral neck fracture may not have an obvious leg deformity. Classically, patients with a displaced femoral neck fracture will have their leg externally rotated and shortened. The one-year mortality rate for someone who sustains a femoral neck fracture is approximately 25-30%. to 30%. The two-year mortality rate with someone with chronic renal failure is approximately 45%. It is important to educate families about the high mortality rate and that these are not benign type injuries. Next, we'll go over some pertinent anatomy that you should know as a medical student. First, the location. Femoral neck fractures are intracapsular. This is important as it can affect healing. The blood supply is limited. It is bathed in synovial fluid and lacks a periosteal layer. Therefore, avascular necrosis is much higher in this region. Femoral neck fractures are divided into three subtypes, subcapital, transcervical, and basocervical. This picture is a representation of these approximate locations. We will now go over the neck to shaft angle, which is a line drawn from the center of the femoral head and a line drawn down the femoral shaft. Where these two lines intersect is also known as the neck shaft angle, which is approximately 130 degrees. The average femoral neck antiversion is at 10 degrees. The major blood supply is the lateral epiphyseal artery of the medial femoral circumflex artery. Next, you should be aware of the calcar, which is located in the posterior medial aspect and contains a dense plate of bone. The calcar provides support to the femoral neck as it is a transitional area to transfer stress from the trabecular bone of the femoral head in the neck to the cortical bone of the femoral shaft. When you suspect a femoral neck fracture, you should obtain an AP pelvis, AP hip, cross table lateral of a hip, full length femur films. In addition, you can obtain a traction with internal rotation x-ray, but this is definitely optional as this can cause a significant amount of pain for the patient. If you decide to do this, you'll need to internally rotate the leg approximately 15 degrees while providing traction. You can also obtain a CT scan. If your imaging such as an x-ray and CT are negative but the patient still has pain and you're suspecting an occult fracture, you can order an MRI. You can order a bone scan. Some physicians will obtain a bilateral lower extremity ultrasounds to rule out a DVT if there's a delay more than two days between fracture fixation and presentation. One of the most important classifications in all of orthopedics is the Garden classification, which is based off an AP x-ray. This classification is broken down into four subtypes. Type 1 is an incomplete fracture with valgus impaction. 
Type 2 is a complete fracture, but it is still non-displaced. Type 3 is a complete fracture that is partially displaced. Type 4 is a complete fracture and fully displaced. Treatment options are dictated based off if the fracture is displaced or non-displaced. Type 1 and 2 are non-displaced, therefore can be treated with cannulated screws. Type 3 and 4 are displaced, therefore treatment consists of either hemiarthroplasty or total hip arthroplasty. Another classification that you should be familiar with is the POWS classification. This classification looks at the fracture orientation and is broken up into three subtypes. This classification gives insight on whether the fracture is more likely to be stable or if the fracture is more likely to be unstable. The more vertically oriented the fracture, the more unstable the fracture is likely to be. Type 1 is less than 30 degrees. Type 2 is between 30 to 50 degrees and type 3 is greater than 50 degrees. There are many factors that you should take into account when treating these types of fractures. The most important predictor of post-operative survival is the patient's pre-injury ambulatory status. Is this patient a community ambulator who does not use any assisted devices, or are they a household ambulator who ambulates with the use of a walker at baseline? You need to consider the age of the patient, the cognitive function, do they have underlying dementia, and the other comorbidities that they might have. Studies have shown that the mortality rate decreases if surgery is performed within 48 hours from the time of injury, but it is important to realize that the patient needs to be medically optimized prior to undergoing surgical intervention. Factors that you must consider preoperatively is whether the fracture is displaced or non-displaced. What is the bone quality like and where is the fracture location? Bone quality is important to consider as you may need to use cement to obtain adequate fixation. We'll now go over the different treatment options. First is non-surgical. Open reduction with internal fixation, which will be the treatment for young or physiologically young patients that sustain a non-displaced or displaced femoral neck fracture as you want to try to preserve their femoral head before undergoing arthroplasty. The next treatment option that we'll go over is percutaneous fixation with three partially threaded cannulated screws in an inverted triangle configuration. This is the treatment of choice for non-displaced femoral neck fractures. The order that the screws should be put in are inferior, then posterior superior, then anterior superior. I remember this with Indian Pale Ale or IPA. The most important screw is the inferior screw as it is adjacent to the cow car. You want to make sure that you place the screws at or above the lesser troke to avoid a stress riser as this can potentially cause a fracture. You want to make sure that your threads cross the fracture site so you get good compression. The most common mode of failure is a varus malreduction. The next treatment option that we'll go over are sliding hip screws. These can be used in basicervical femoral neck fractures or fractures that are vertically oriented. Next, arthroplasty. Hemiarthroplasty can be used in displaced femoral neck fractures. You would be more inclined to use this in the more debilitated or less active patient. You might be asked on rotations if there's any advantage between bipolar or unipolar heads. There is no difference between a unipolar or bipolar head. Total hip arthroplasty is indicated in more active patients, patients with pre-existing acetabular disease, or inflammatory arthritis. It is important to realize that total hip arthroplasty has a higher dislocation rate, greater blood loss, a larger exposure that is needed, longer operative time, higher risk of infection, but it is best at relieving pain, has fewer re-operations, and has the best survivorship. We will now turn our attention towards the different surgical approaches that you can use. First, the Smith-Peterson, also known as the anterior approach. The superficial dissection is between the sartorius and the tensor fascia lata. The deep surgical dissection is between the rectus femoris and the gluteus medius. The nerves that are at risk are the lateral femoral cutaneous and the femoral nerve. If a neuropraxia occurs to the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, the patient will classically describe numbness, burning, and pain over the lateral thigh. 
Preoperatively, it is important to tell your patients that this is a potential complication. The artery that needs to be cauterized during your surgical approach is the ascending branch of the lateral femoral circumflex artery. The next surgical approach that we'll go over is the Watson-Jones, also known as the anterior lateral approach. The surgical plane is between the tensor fascia lata and the gluteus medius. The nerve that is at risk is the femoral nerve. The arteries that are at risk are the ascending branch of the lateral femoral circumflex and the femoral artery. Some potential complications with this surgical approach are having an abductor limp as you must cut the gluteus medius and minimus. You can have a femoral shaft fracture, most commonly this is during dislocation, and this approach has a higher rate of heterotopic ossification. The next surgical approach that we'll go over is the Hardinge or lateral approach. The surgical plane is between the gluteus medius and the vastus lateralis. The nerve that you must be aware of is the superior gluteal nerve, which is approximately three to five centimeters proximal to the greater choke. If this nerve is injured, it can lead to a Trendelenburg gait as this nerve innervates the tensor fascia lata, the gluteus medius, and minimus. In addition, it is important to repair the abductors when you do your closure to prevent this complication. Many times during your surgical approach, you'll see that there's already a tear in the abductors, so the patient preoperatively may have already had a Trendelenburg gait. Another nerve that is at risk is the femoral nerve, which is medial to your surgical field, and it's important to place your medial retractors on bone and not on the soft tissue. Some potential complications with this approach are abductor limp, femoral shaft fracture, most commonly during dislocation, and heterotopic ossification. The final surgical approach that we'll talk about is the southern approach, also called the Moore approach, also known as the posterior approach. There is no internervous plane as the surgical dissection is through the gluteus maximus. The nerve that is most at risk is the sciatic nerve, but also the superior gluteal nerve. It is important intraoperatively to monitor for any foot twitches while performing your dissection as this indicates if you are close to the sciatic nerve. If the sciatic nerve is damaged, it will lead to a foot drop. In this approach, there are several arteries that are at risk. We will now talk about the various complications that can occur when treating femoral neck fractures. First, avascular necrosis, or AVN, is increased with initial displacement and if there's non-anatomical reduction. Remember earlier in this presentation when we stressed the importance of this fracture being intracapsular and how this has poor blood supply. Another complication that can occur are malunions. The most common is in varus. If this malreduction occurs, you can treat it with a valgus intertrochanteric osteotomy or with an arthroplasty. Dislocations can occur. Remember, with total hip arthroplasty, the risk is five to seven times higher than hemiarthroplasty, and also failure. We will finish our discussion on femoral neck fractures with a few practice cases. For each case, I recommend pausing the video and trying to read the x-rays for yourself. I will then give my interpretation of each case. So here we have two views of an AP pelvis and AP right hip demonstrating a displaced right femoral neck fracture. How would you treat this? There are two different treatment options, but in this case, it was treated with a right hemiarthroplasty. Case three, how would you read this x-ray? We have two views, AP pelvis, AP left hip, demonstrating a displaced left femoral neck fracture with varus angulation. How would you treat this? Again, there are two different treatment options, but in this case, it was treated with a left hemiarthroplasty. Case four, how would you read this x-ray? We have three views, AP pelvis, AP right hip, and cross table lateral of a right hip demonstrating a valgus impacted right femoral neck fracture. How would you treat this fracture? This fracture was treated with three partially threaded cannulated screws. Case five, 
We have two views, AP pelvis and AP right hip, demonstrating a displaced right femoral neck fracture. How would you treat this? This fracture was treated with a right hemiarthroplasty. Case 6. How would you read this x-ray? We have three views, AP pelvis, AP right hip, and cross table lateral of a right hip, demonstrating a non-displaced right subcapital femoral neck fracture. How would you treat this? This fracture was treated with two fully threaded cannulated cancellous screws and a single partially threaded cannulated cancellous lag screw with a washer. Now we'll go over some sample PIMP questions that you might be asked while on rotations. First question, what are the three types of femoral neck fractures? Subcapital, transcervical, and basocervical. Second question, what is the main classification of femoral neck fractures? Garden. Question three, what are the names of the different surgical approaches to the hip? Anterior, also known as the Smith-Peterson approach. Anterior lateral, also known as the Watson-Jones. The lateral, also known as the Hardinge. And the posterior, also known as the Moore or Southern approach. Question four. What is the superficial surgical dissection for the Smith-Peterson approach to the hip, and what is the deep surgical plane? The superficial approach is between the sartorius and the tensor fascia lata. The deep surgical approach is between the rectus femoris and the gluteus medius. Question 5. What is the proper order for placement of the three cannulated screws? Inferior, posterior, and anterior. Remember Indian Pale Ale or IPA. Question 6. Which nerve is most at risk during the southern approach and what is the physical exam finding if this nerve is injured? The sciatic nerve and on physical exam this would correspond with a foot drop. Question 7. What is the major blood supply to the femoral head? It's the medial femoral circumflex artery. Question 8. What makes a femoral neck fracture different from an inner troch hip fracture? intercapsular versus extracapsular. Question 9. What is the percentage of femoral neck fractures with an associated femoral shaft fracture? 6 to 9 percent. Question 10. What imaging modality is used if you're suspicious of a hip fracture but radiographs are negative? An MRI to rule out a cult fracture. Question 11. What are the two origins of the rectus femoris muscle? the anterior inferior iliac spine, and the superior acetabular rim. Question 12. What is the normal antiversion of the femoral neck? 10 degrees. Question 13. What treatment, hemiarthroplasty or total hip arthroplasty, has a higher dislocation rate? Total hip arthroplasty. Question 14. What is the position of a patient's leg who sustains a displaced femoral neck fracture, shortened and externally rotated? Last question. Name the five short external rotators of the hip that are exposed in the posterior approach. Piriformis, superior gemellus, obturator internus, inferior gemellus, and the quadratus femoris. And that's all for femoral neck fractures. Until next time, thank you for listening, and hopefully that was helpful. Be sure to give us a thumbs up or leave us a comment so we can better serve you.